Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the correct views. You might jiggle on high def. Uh, it, uh, put your finger in front of high def, Christelle. If you're looking at a finger in front of you, there you go. You are on high def. If you do not have a finger in front of you, then go to the mediaspeaks.com um, and uh, probably within the 12 hours of when this is posted, the high def will have loaded. Of course, it is St. Patrick's Day. I'm reporting for the Media Speaks, and uh, yes, there is a shamrock on my cheek, and I'm wearing green because I'm also a DJ, and that's what I wore today. So I've got to do this, guys. It's come to my attention... Then Mr. Zuckerberg, I'd like to put an F at the beginning of it. Mr. Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg, has um, taken it upon himself that if you wish to use Facebook, it is his American right to limit how much you can talk about guns. Never mind the fact that American implies America. According to the Constitution, us Americans believe that it is a God-given right. And the Zuckerberg, while you may in fact be quite successful, you are not God. So the first three stories on this are for you, buddy. Eat it! Gun news from the correct views, which is pro-Second Amendment, Zuckerberg. Get down on all fours and bite my ass and rate its taste on YouTube, you piece of sellout scum. Infowars.com, Kit Daniels. ATF raids gun parts store and seizes customer data. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms raided a guns parts manufacturer over the weekend after a federal judge overruled a restraining order preventing the raid. What a great judge. ATF agents equipped with M4s and plate armor conducted the raid on Aris Armor in National City, California, in order to seize manufacturer's customers' data with the help of local locksmith who cracked the safe inside the store. That is why it looks like it's becoming a better, better, a better, better idea, I should say, to go ahead and get a fake ID. Remember, remember the stuff you used to get when you were 16 and you wanted people to believe you were 21 and you grow out that little bit of fuzz that you think is going to make you look older and every once in a while it worked? Well, fake IDs look like they might be important for more than just those guys. Was I ever one? No. But... This, this is exactly why you're going to find a, a, a responsible, hardworking, nonviolent adults getting fake IDs. And I encourage it. That's why I said it. The company's owner, Dimitrios Karas, said that the ATF targeted his company under the false claim, and there's a link to that, that Aris Armor was making AR-15 lower receivers, which are classified as a firearm, and then reverting back to the unfinished receivers not classified as firearms according to the law. And for you people that go, well, why would you need so many bullets? Right now... We have flash mobs going into stores, sometimes 15, 20, 30 people rushing in the store, stealing everything they can get their hands on and running out the door. Now, you mean to tell me if an earthquake, tornado, uh, nuclear power plant meltdown, God forbid, uh, you mean to tell me if that happens that these mobs won't start turning to people's houses once the stores are empty? Well, once that happens, Barney Fife, you're going to have more than 10 bullets! Even though the ATF was informed of their mistake, according to Karras, the agency proceeded with the raid anyway in order to gain access to private customer information as well as seize the company's inventory of unfinished receivers known as 80% receivers. They said either give us these 5,000 names or we're coming in and we're pretty much taking everything, which is huge. Huge privacy concern and something they were not willing to do, he added. Uh, can I ask why in the hell the bonehead kept the computer at the business that he works in? Why in the world wouldn't you take all of that customer data? Unless it's, you know, somebody that just came in the store. But the, the vast bulk of it. Put it on a jump drive and bury it. I'm sorry I'm on Karas's side, but he is kind of a dumb D here. He's not the brightest crayon in the box, is he? 
Last week, Eric Armour's Eris Armour successfully fired a temporary restraining order to prevent the ATF from raiding the business, but Judge Janice L. Sarmentino, who should be disbarred, later allowed the agency to proceed. Uh, the ATF also raided E. P. Armory last week for the exact same reasons. So, what have we learned? Uh, that you want to have a fake ID present when you buy a gun. And we have learned that if you own a gun shop, be smart enough to not keep the data that they're looking for in places that they might actually look. Welcome to the Correct Views. Uh, Mikkel Thalen, one of the best journalists extant today. New York residents set fire to gun registration forms. I love this. Why do I love this? Because I have been saying forever that the way that we fight back from this is resistance. Resistance is our friend here, people. It's that simple. Um, if... I always use this analogy. I might as well go to it again. Regular viewers, just skip ahead 15 seconds. Um, let's take license registration. If half the drivers in any one state, or even half of New York City for that matter, were to refuse to get their license renewed and kept driving without any damn insurance, it's against the law. If 100 people do that, 100 people are going to get screwed. But if half of New York City did it, there's not enough jail space on Rikers Island or anywhere else to prosecute all of you. They're only going to be able to go after those who are a real threat. Well, if you apply this to other areas of life, it works just as well. That's why I'm out here talking into a camera. Shazam, Sparky! Well, here we go, here it is in action. Second Amendment supporters, writes Mikhail Thalen, in the Saratoga Springs, New York, burned nearly 1,000 gun registration forms this Sunday in protest of the New York SAFE Act. And we are very, very happy about that, aren't we, Mr. Zuckerberg? As the April 15th assault weapons registration deadline draws near, as I'm putting on Facebook.com, members of the NY2A Grassroots Coalition are encouraging noncompliance at educational forums across the state. Our goal is to keep the registration numbers as low as possible, NY2A co-founder Lisa Donovan told StoryLeak. The message yesterday was focused on those options, including the mods that can be made to avoid registration. In an act of defiance, it goes on to the unconstitutional law group member provided attendees with access to not only a barbecue grill, but to copies of the state's registration form as well. We ended the event with a raffle of a New York legal AR, which does not stand for assault rifle, and then we gave people registration cards to burn outside as they were leaving, Donovan said. Nearly everyone in attendance was seen torching the forms, an act of civil disobedience that is likely to be replicated across the state and hopefully most states that are trying such things. I think for me, it demonstrated our resolve to oppose unjust laws and our passion to live free, Rob Arigo said. The group also pointed to the law's loosely written language, which many feel is an open door to Second Amendment cases. It's mentioned in here but that it doesn't allow you to pass the guns down when you die. Um, the fact is 84% of the counties in New York passed non-binding resolutions protesting the SAFE Act and the manner in which it was passed. So what we are seeing, go to the article for the rest of it, friends, what we are seeing is mass disobedience working working. Now, there's going to be some bonehead out there that goes, what if all of us decided to start murdering? Should we be allowed to? Well, other than the morons in the thug culture, maybe a few other fringe idiots, uh, I don't think that's likely to happen because most people want to live free. Most people don't want to hurt anyone. That is also a correct view. Um, this is, uh, Bloomberg says that he can outspend the NRA by Amy Carbine. Um, this is, we're boneheaded in this here. Uh, Bloomberg, human piece of scum, says he can outspend the NRA. And this is, of course, on Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook.com page, I'm sure. In a bid to push more draconian anti-gun legislation, former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg claims that he can outspend the NRA. 
Among those of us who love the Second Amendment, uh, Mr. Bloomberg's crimes against unconstitutional freedom are already outrageous, so his latest statement comes as no surprise. However, it is a prime example of the arrogance and overconfident politicians who have no remorse at trampling the standards set by our founding fathers, that is to say, pointing out what our God-given rights are. Katie Couric, Mr. Zuckerberg, from Yahoo, asked Bloomberg about his support for anti-gun legislation. You think that you can really outspend the NRA and gun manufacturers, she asked. Oh, sure, Bloomberg replied. I'm not the only founder of this funder of this. If all of these groups raise money, there are other people who understand. They want their kids to be safe. Yeah, yeah, and of course they were awful safe in the schools where nobody could bring guns to defend them, of course. It's fascinating that he actually thinks that he can get away with using the safety of our nation's children as a reason to leave American citizens utterly defenseless against threats. Totally true in every possible way. Let us also not let forget what I just said. The, the, these these gun free laws work so well that in in areas where you can't bring them, like schools, that's where the shootings always happen, and that can't be overlooked. Friends, you're listening to the Correct Views. Um, it's brought to you in part by the Arcadia Grill. And uh, you want some really good food, then you may, in fact, want to look into the Arcadia Grill because that's what they have, delicious food. I am addicted to their raviolis, and I keep eating them nonstop. They have pulled pork there. It's full of onions and green peppers. It's delicious. And then you like mosey on over to the bar, and guess what? They've got delicious drinks. Uh, they make they make drinks the way you remember them. Remember when bartenders used to put alcohol in them? They do too. You don't get a watered down piece of crap when you go to the Arcadia Grill. So do me a favor when you do show up there, let them know that Sam from the Correct Views sent you. That uh, helps the show and helps the restaurant. Also look up the work of Mike McLaughlin. M A C L A U G H L A U G H L I N. He is a writer of stories. He is on Facebook.com. Now look up Mike McLaughlin. Let him know you want to purchase some short stories or maybe some poetry. Let him know because he will send it to you. And uh, it's supporting uh, it's supporting local works. Let's face it. I'm a writer. There are not a lot of publishers out there because America is too stupid to read. So if you are, in fact, one of the few people that do still read, then go to Facebook.com. Look up the work of Mike McLaughlin. And uh, I hope Zuckerberg liked the part, first part of the show. Hey, Marco boy, you want to shut me down? That's fine. I'll make such a stink that I'll have more traffic on the next site that I set up than the one you shut down, jerko. Don't mess with people's God-given rights. Friends, examiner.com. South Carolina policy requiring a fee and permit to feed the homeless begins. This is the ultimate Ebenezer Scrooge Act. Uh, and no, feeding the homeless does not bring more homeless. That is a lie. You are not the reason they are on the streets. It's the other way around. They were on the streets before you. Feeding the homeless is about to get harder as a new policy is set to begin this Saturday, March 15th in Columbia. South Carolina charities and nonprofits will be required to pay a fee and obtain a permit 15 days in advance in order to feed homeless in parks. Well, what do we know from the last gun registration story? We know that if you all started feeding them without any regard whatsoever, and you all did it at the same time, they wouldn't be able to do a damn thing about it. Look up Anthony Gucciardi's work on this topic. Uh, one impacted charity that was interviewed by the Free Times of Food Not Bombs has been serving food to the homeless in Finley Park every Sunday for 12 years, and they should keep doing so in greater numbers. The group's organizer, Judith Turnipseed, 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 really? Noted that the group has an impe impeccable track record and always tidies up after the meal, but the new crackdown food not bombs will have to pay at least $120 per week for the right to feed the homeless. Oh, but eugenics isn't happening, right? We have no formal organization. Uh, Turnip Seed says we don't have 501k, 501c3s. We're just a group of people who come to the park and bring food and share it with anyone who comes. That includes people who are homeless and people who have a home but are hungry. It's a people's picnic. Well, you're not allowed to have anything like that. It's America. 
Since the Columbia City Council approved its exile plan in August, the city has been trying to herd its homeless people to a shelter on the outskirts of town and keep them away from downtown. If charities continue to provide food in downtown parks, the thinking goes it will allow the homeless people to continue to live downtown rather than being forced to leave. Then it is the city's job to move them to the shelter. It is not the city's job to punish the people who are feeding the homeless who they failed to move to the shelter based on their own ordinance. Town of Seed is currently considering legal action to prevent enforcement of the measure. God bless, God bless the good people. I know I laughed at her name, but that's fine. She can laugh at mine. Point is, she's doing a wonderful thing, and uh, I'm happy to happy to report that I don't doesn't look like they're giving up anytime soon. Two more stories I want to get to: TruthStreamMedia.com. This is the awesome Melissa Melton. Can't pay for school lunch, kids? It asks, have fun starving while the school throws your food away. And this isn't even the dumb of the day. But I do want to talk about how uh, wonderful we're being. Well, you know, we're just saying we don't need so many homeless. We got the homeless guy. He's always bugging me for money. And let's move them out of town. And let's bust the people feeding them because we failed to move them out of town. All right. That's fine. It's not going to progress any further, right? It's not going to be affecting our children, or will it? Let's let Melissa Mountain answer that. What in the hell is going on in our schools today, she writes. No, I'm not just talking about the atrocity that is Common Core. All over the country, stories are surfacing of hungry public school children who don't have enough money to pay for school lunches getting their food seized and thrown into the garbage instead. That's right, when a student can't afford to pay for the government-subsidized tripe that our education facilities pass off to our kids as food, or if they are even a few measly cents short in some cases, these children have to stand there hungry and watch in humiliation as the school employees throw their food into the garbage. I was slightly overweight as a kid, uh, and I know they, they, you know, you're that guy, and let's make his life hell. Um... Imagine being the kid too poor to pay for his lunch. Well, let's humiliate him in front of everyone. How's that? When a student can't afford to pay for the government subsidized... Or I read that already. The schools aren't billing the parents and giving the student this food, which are they're apparently just going to completely waste by tossing it in the trash anyway. Nope. Because that might, you know, make sense in a modicum of... At least a modicum of sense. Very well. Schools all over the nation are instituting no-pay-no-food policies. A handful may at least give a child some milk or a piece of fruit or bread, you know, the kind of meal that really lends itself to high academic achievement. I love how she writes. These aren't isolated cases either. There's a recap of the most recent honor roll of American public school cafeteria debauchery. I'm going to read uh, three of them randomly. Go to the article which is very well written, for the rest. An elementary school in Salt Lake City, Utah, reportedly seized between 40 to 50 students' lunches on pizza day, which, if you remember, was like the deity day, and threw them all in the garbage when kids got up to the register and couldn't pay because their account balances were either low or empty. Students all over the cafeteria were broken down in tears. I'm sure that made for a great learning environment. And don't say this has always been the case. My dad, God rest his soul, was an LPN and he made good money. But I'm pretty sure, even though it's a little fuzzy back in the, you know, the stone, and we're using stone tablets back when I went to school. Um, I do remember a time or two that I simply forgot to bring the money off my mom. Or I left it in the car or did something dumb on the way in. I just paid it when I, you know, later on it was paid. Nobody even said anything about it the next day it was forgotten. Uh, here's another one. A New Jersey elementary school threw a 10-year-old autistic boy's lunch in the trash. There's a link for that. Because of an unpaid account, despite having already done so before. It's between the parents and the cafeteria. It's not between the child and the lunch lady. It lets the kids eat their lunch, the boy's mother told a local news station. You know what? 
If I was her, I'd have killed him. I, I'm not making fun of the mother. I know it sounds like it. If I was her, I'd probably be in jail right now. I would be livid, people. And no, I'm not making fun of her. Uh, last thing I want to get to in this article, um, one more quote. Worse, apparently, students at some schools across the state of Minnesota are actually branded with money or lunch stamps across their hands when they ate when they were late on accounts of the message to pay up. Yep, they are actually branding children with the scarlet letter of poverty if they cannot afford their lunch. So the child will have to walk around the whole entire rest of the day branded and walking target for ridicule by children because they are poor or the parents simply forgot to put the money into the accounts. Because you know in Nazi America, you're supposed to only focus on what the school system is indoctrinating to your children or we will starve them. Um, it says the point here is the food is already there, already cooked and already paid for. The school is just throwing it away in front of the hungry child. And I agree with it. Uh, again, go to the truth, uh, truth, truthstreammedia.com. It's Melissa Melton's article. And that brings us to the dumdy of the day, which is even stupider than the last article. This is from Kit Daniels, Infowars.com, reporting... New York to widow, sorry about your husband's death, and now hand over $27,000. For those of you that don't know, I give the Dunce Cap of the Month award out once a month. It's the beginning of the month, first week or so. Uh, and I send a uh, certificate and a Dunce Cap, handmade by the behind-the-scenes queen, Christelle, to one idiot every month. Organization, person, judge, individual, whatever. At the end of every show, I have the dumdy of the day, because I can't keep up with all the dumdies that I get in one month now since I started mailing these. So here is the dumdy of the day. They didn't win the dunce cap of the month, but all of these people are stupid enough that they may, in fact, do so before very long. A pension director with the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority sent a letter to a 79-year-old widow of a train engineer telling her that she's sorry for the death of her husband, but she needs to repay the $27,000 in excess benefits due to a clerical error made by the agency in 1995. Shirley Fendel, whose husband Harry died in September, received the letter after the MTA checked its books and realized that the Public Railroad's pension fund had been overpaying Harry for nearly two decades. So the widow, uh, two decades ago at 59 years old, was supposed to be an accountant and a lawyer, and she was supposed to keep charge of the books at her husband's form, uh, place of employment and not know that she was in fact being paid too much so she must have been taking it, and now they need it back because she was sinister and she was hoarding it, and certainly she still has it. Now you see why they're getting the dumb deer of the day. What do I want you to do with this information? I want you to call these people and tell them you think they're stupid bastards. That's what I want you to do. I can't afford to send dunce caps to everyone. Dear Mrs. Findell, the letter began, please accept my condolences for the loss of your husband, Harry Findell, or when reviewing Mr. Findell's file to determine what benefits are payable to you under the plan, it came to our attention that Mr. Findell's monthly pension was processed incorrectly. The letter then stated that the overpayment to Mr. Findell from 1995 to his death last September totaled almost $27,000 and that the MTA is obligated to recover the overpayment. For those on you who were on podcast, I was drinking, hence the break. If you do not dispute this overpayment, you can repay the $26,707.20 in full or through a repayment schedule, the letter added. Yeah, because she has it in her back pocket. She knew it was happening all the time. Mrs. Fennell was later informed that she could pay the money back with $240 monthly payment over nine years, according to Long Island Newsday. Yes, yeah, she'll be about uh, 90, depending on when her birthday falls. Yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe your kids can pay it if she keels over, you stupid swine. Mrs. Fennell was later informed that she, oh, I read that. I don't think I should have to pay for their mistake, she said. It took them 18 and a half years to find out. 
We didn't know. I have the paper Harry signed. He gave them the paper, and we figured that everything was fine. I wake up thinking about this, and I go to bed thinking about this. What a way to treat a 79-year-old widow whose husband just died in September. That's just hella sweet of you. She also mentioned that her income has already dropped sharply after the death of her husband, and that if the state keeps pursuing her, she may be forced to sell the house she shared with her late husband. Friends, that's what human scum does. Do me a favor, look these bastards up and let them know how very happy we are with them. Friends, you are listening to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangi reporting for The Media Speaks and signing off. Look up the work of Kyle Court, D. Lake, and myself. You will find uh, it's top-heavy. It's good for the mind. It's good for the brain. Makes you progress as a person. So go to themediaspeaks.com, look up our work, and please donate to the show if you can at uh, thecorrectviews at hotmail.com. Good night, friends. God bless.